Good afternoon. Assalamualaikum girls. Could you hear me? Yes. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. How are you girls? Alhamdulillah miss. What about you? Alhamdulillah. Okay. Uh, hopefully others will be joining very soon. But I want to start. Which paper are we doing? Are we yeah. still doing 41 major 19? No, yeah. Yesterday we went to 42 major 19. And we have finished with question number six. So I want to start question number seven today. So that is 42 major 19. And question number seven we were supposed to oh, do. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. So I want uh, both of you to open that. So that we can start doing it. Okay, 42. We'll start question number seven. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, as far as I remember, yesterday I have finished question number six. Yeah, that was the weight question. We did it yesterday. Do you remember? Yes, miss. Okay, so let's go for question number seven now. Uh, and it is written in the figure. 7.1, a converging lens projects a sharp image of an object O onto the screen. Now, if we just look at it, O is a point object. Okay. Complete the path of the two rays from the object to the screen. So, we know that the way they have given us the diagram, we have to complete the path means we are going to just extend the rays to go till the middle of the lens. You may, might have seen a dotted line is given as the middle line. So you are going to extend both the rays to go and touch that particular point, the middle line. And from there, already you can see on the screen, the principal axis is there. So both the rays are going to meet at that particular point where the principal axis is going to. Okay, guys. So uh, I want you to check that uh, the point object O is going to have an image on the screen at the same point. Okay, guys. Miss, is it? Uh, it will be at the same point. Same yes. thing, right? Yes, yes. Forty-two, May to nineteen. Question number seven and eight. Okay. So yes, I yes. told you that the two rays, the uh, two rays that is given in the first chain paper, you have to extend them until they met the middle line. And then from there, you're going to uh, trace them the point where the uh, principal axis is on the top of the screen. So we'll be getting a point image of the point object O. So this is done. Now from the next one, if you just compare both the diagram, you'll see in 7.1 figure, the uh, lens was thicker. And later they're going to use, a, or they're using a thinner lens. Right, guys? So, they are asking us that uh, the same way they show the whole thing, but we have to draw this data. And they say, complete the path of the two rays from the object to the screen. But they say one thing, that they changed the lens, but they did not change the position of the screen and the object. So we, have, we should remember one point that a thicker lens is actually going to have uh, a particular focal length. But if you compare a thinner lens with a thicker lens, Thinner lens is going to have a focal length which will be longer than the thinner, uh, thicker lens. So a thinner lens is having long focal length. That is why when you are going to complete the path of the two rays in uh, part B of the question, you have to just uh, join them at the back of the screen in a certain point. Just highlight your point at the back of the screen and then join them at the back. Initially, the two rays will come and touch the middle point of the lens. Correct. After that, you have to join them at the back of the screen. Because this idea is there for us, which is like, uh, it will be always at the, uh, the focal length will increase when you make it as a thinner uh, lens. Okay? Girls, I can see a person is waiting, Sam, who Sam? S-A-I-M. Anybody know? Uh, that's and Uh huh. I don't know the person. Do we have any student like that? I don't remember actually. Who's this particular name? I don't know. Okay. Miss, I think so. That's Sanjita. Sanjita. Okay. Maybe. Okay. Let me see. Okay, let's, let's 
proceed. I hope you have uh, completed the diagram girls. Did you complete this part B? Yes, miss. Okay. Now I want to check. Just one minute. Ah. I hope you have completed the diagram, then we'll proceed to the next diagram. Okay. Next is it a part C of the question. That is a converging lens is used as a magnifying glass. Okay, now I hope you remember what is this converging lens that we learned and what is this about magnifying glass? We learned that okay, my name. so that is Sanjida Chodi. Okay, no problem. Let's continue, Sanjida. Uh, okay. Now look, they said here the focal length of the lens uh, of this particular lens is 10 cm. Now, if you remember, in when we were learning the lens part, we discussed that whenever you keep an object in between the focal point and the center, that is center of the lens, that is the optical center. If you keep an object in between the optical center and the focal point, then you'll be getting an image which is actually a virtual image and large virtual image and our image will be also positioned at the same side of the lens as the object. That all this information we learned in our uh, lesson when we were studying the lens part. So uh, now come to this part, they're asking us uh, some question regarding that particular topic. So what could be that possible thing that we are discussing now? Regarding that whole thing we'll be discussing. So they say here, Describe the position of the lens in relation to the position of the object in relation to the lens. So, okay. yes, who can give me the answer, girls? Anyone? What could be that one? Because we are using it as a uh, as a magnifying glass. So, where should we, we keep the object there to use it as a magnifying glass? Right now, I told you right that the object should be placed in between the optical center and uh, one of the principal focus because we know that we have two principal focus uh, for a lens in on either side of the lens so you can just pick one of the one of the point and then you are going to place the object in between the optical center and one of the principal focus is it clear girls yes miss. did you follow the answer yes okay, okay fine. let's go to the next one they say describe the position of the image in relation to the lens and the object I already mentioned right now that the image will be at the same side of the lens as the object. So that's what we are going to write here. As the same side of the lens as the object. The image is formed on the same side of the lens as the object. Okay, guys. Shall I proceed now? Go. Oh. Yes, this is the next part of the question C3 is that give three properties of the image formed by a magnifying glass. First of all, it is a virtual, upright. At the same time, it is enlarged or magnified. We can use the word magnified as well. So virtual, upright, magnified. Okay. So I hope you are done with this question number seven. Shall I proceed to question number eight? Yes, miss. Okay. Before going to question number eight, girls, I just want to ask you something uh, regarding that uh, tuition fees. How many of you have already paid that year? Among uh, you nine girls, how many of you paid? Could you tell me, please? Did you inform your parents first of all? Yes, inform. Informing is done. Okay. So just in contact with them. Yes, fine. Just check with your parents, girls, that whether it is done or not, because we have to check it with you and uh, by the time you know miss anju she is also the secretary of our school she might even call you for that to check with you that whether it is uh, informed at your right. parents or not okay fine so let's proceed now to question number eight now we are saying that a, con uh, a conducting sphere is mounted on a on an insulating stand okay this is about static electricity right girls Explain how you would use a positively charged rod of insulating material to charge the sphere by induction. Okay, you have to just mention about the three steps. Now, do you remember what are those steps that you have learned regarding the static electricity? 
Do you remember those? And if there is one to the yes. yes, I remember this. Okay, fine. So tell me what is the first step that we go for? Uh, we put the rod near the metal ball first. Yeah, you can say that. Uh, first, and we then do that. Bring the positive uh, sphere rod close to the, no positive charge rod. Yes, they gave us the positively charged rod. So we have to say bring the positively charged rod close to the sphere. Okay. Now point number two. And then uh, the uh, so, the charges neutralize. No, 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 like no, the no. electrons. No, 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 no. Second step will be connect the sphere to the earth by a conducting wire. Isn't oh, yes, that? I forgot that. Yeah. Yes, yes. That one you'll do, then you'll get that one. Okay. Uh, connect the sphere to earth by a conducting wire. Okay. Now, number three, remove and the earth. Then the electrons. Uh, no, we will uh, not say, uh, Anika, listen, we will not say what is happening. Here they are asking what is the step here going to follow. Just a use? method. Yes, just a method. Just the method. Yes. So then remove the uh, remove the earthing done. Yes, remove the earthing, but you have to mention one more thing by keeping the charge rod in position. Because if you remove the charge rod, then it will lose all the charges. So remove the earthing by keeping the charge rod in position. And finally, remove the charge rod. Okay, that's okay. how we are going to proceed. Because without first remove the earthing and then remove the charge object. Yes, but when you are writing, you move the earthing you have to mention by keeping the charge rod in position. That time you will not uh, okay. make any change in that. It has to be there. Okay. Now, after that, if you just look at the next part of the question, that is HB. Uh, they say they have given us a diagram of an electronic uh, component. They are asking us the name of that one. So, what's the Light name? Light emitting diode. Okay, fine. LED or light emitting diode? You can write full form LED. Okay, now in the space below, write down the truth table for a NAND gate. I think this one you can do, right, girls? NAND gate? Yes, this is easy. Easy one. Input and output you have, you can put in ABC and then that. Because every time we know that whenever there is a uh, one, uh, okay, only one one, oh, it's a NAND gate. So one one will give us a zero. And the rest of all now there's all will all will one. Yes, correct. Now you come to the next part of the question that is also a logic based question. Just check truth that, table. yeah, there's a truth table given and they have given us a connection of the logic table. So they're asking yes. us to, yes, yeah, they're asking us to find out the intermediate point that is D and what will be the final point E output. Here. So if we just look at D. Okay, first D will be uh, representing A and B. So uh, uh, D, the first one is zero. So it's zero, zero, one. zero will be zero, and then one, one, one. Correct. Zero, one, one, one. Correct. Then yes. you come to uh, E. For E, we are and going to e consider and gate. So it will it's D and C. Okay. So it will be zero. Yes. Then one. Zero, then one. Then and then zero again. Zero, one. Yes, zero and one. Yes, it's so one zero one zero. Yes, one zero one zero. No, it is zero one zero one. Zero one zero one. Yes, yes. <laughs> it is zero one zero one. Okay, fine. Now, uh, I hope there is no doubt about this particular question, right, girls? No, miss. Okay, let's go to nine. Question number nine. Describe how to, how to demagnetize a bar magnet using alternating current in a coil. Okay, mm -hmm. they, they already gave us the uh, most important information that we have to use an alternating current. Rather than that, some other things you have to explain here. So, what is that that we need to say here? Three months they gave to us. In fact, the question should have been how to demagnetize a bar magnet. Okay, but they mentioned the important point already in the first. So, we have to add the supporting points to help it. Okay, who can tell me what else we have to write here? Anyone? Okay, Alpha, could you tell me what will you write in that position? Already they have given us AC. Along with that, what we should do? Do you remember first what we do? First, we have to place the magnet inside the coil. Okay, and then one more point is there that is we have to place it in the east-west direction. Okay, and then 
And what we do, we switch on the circuit and withdraw the magnet slowly. It's very important point. Withdraw the magnet slowly. First, AC current has to be here, alternating current. And then it, you have to place the magnet inside the coil in the east-west direction. Okay, why do we need to put it in the east-west direction? Do you remember, girls? What was the reason behind it? Not really, miss. Okay. We actually, I'm not so good at this. Okay. Yes, miss. Right? We are actually trying to, uh, you can say, ignore the uh, magnetic field of the Earth. Because we know that north and south is actually the magnetic field of the Earth. So our yes, magnetism, we have to ignore. That is why we are going to keep the uh, magnet in the east-west direction and switch on the circuit. And slowly, we are going to withdraw the magnet from the from the uh, that coil. Okay. Is it done, girls? Okay. Now go for the next one. It's a DC motor. Explain the purpose of the split ring commutator. Okay. Um, reverse the direction of current in the coil, right, Miss? Yes, it changes the direction of the current as well as it keeps on the uh, coil rotating uh, for a continuous time or continuous rotation. So, so what is it again? It one minute. First of all, it changes the direction of the current in the coil. Yes. After every half cycle, it changes the direction of the current in the coil after every half cycle and keeps a continuous rotation. And keeps half a cycle. cycle and keeps a continuous rotation of the coil. And sorry, Miss, and keeps a continuous rotation of the coil. A continuous, continuous rotation of the coil. Okay. Now, if you just look at the diagram, DC motor is something the one we call current causing motion. Right? So they are asking. That the voltage of the power supply is increased. Take the effect that has on the motor. So what could possibly happen to the motor? The current is increased. Mm -hmm. No, the power. Like, we are not, as we said, we are not uh, producing electricity here. We are giving electricity to make the coil rotate. So you hmm. increase the voltage. So what do what you have? What do you want to happen inside the motor? The coil will rotate faster. Hmm. This is right. current causing motion. So in increasing the voltage increases the current, increases the rotation. That's it. So the coil Miss, is, yes. Miss, just like the purpose of split ring commutator, uh, could you please uh, tell the purpose for the slip ring commutator as well? Slip ring commutator does the same thing over there. But there we have two uh, you know, circular rings, which is paced one after another, and the two ends of the uh, coil is going to attach with them. The same thing is happening over there. Those slip ring commutators or slip rings are actually allowing the uh, coil to, to rotate continuously and change the direction of the motor. So part. it's the same thing? Same thing. Okay. okay. Now I want you to go to question number 10. I want to turn the page and reach for question number 10. Uh, there we see that Question. Parallel resistance plus mm -hmm. series mm -hmm. resistance equals the total resistance. Mm -hmm. So first we find out the parallel resistance and then whatever comes out, we add it with the series 0 0.2. Oh. Yes, yes. But did you show the parallel connection uh, calculation? Means you have to write the equation 1 by RP equals? Oh, yes. Uh, that's for sure. <laughs> or, or else how am I doing it? So it's 1 by uh, RP equals 1 by 0 0.2 plus mm -hmm. 1 by 0 0.3. Mm -hmm. okay, so so I, get, I get, what do I get? 0 0.32, 0 0.32 ohm altogether. Yes, so 0. then I do, so RS equals 0 0.32 no, plus no, 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 no. 0. RP comes out actually uh, 0 0.12, 0 0.12 okay. ohm. And then RS equals to RP plus RQ. So RP, yes. you got 0 0.12 now, and RQ was 0 0.2. So if you add them now, you will get 0 0.32. Total yes. resistance. Yes. Yes, that's fine. So now I want you to go to part B of the question. The potential difference of the supply is increased so that the current in the lamp increases. Okay. 
okay take an expand any case in the resistance of the lamp okay mm. uh, this is if the current one. increases resistance decreases right let me check here again they say pd of the supply is about to increase so that the current in the lamp increases okay pd increases means you know why because if you just consider 0.2 ohm and 0.3 ohm the lamp and the resistor they are connected in parallel and then the 0.2 is in series so these two part is actually acting like a potential divider circuit so when they increase the voltage here that voltage is going to be divided among these two so if the lamp is getting more current now so the resistance of the lamp getting gets increases it increases because they are going to draw more voltage to the from the circuit because it is a potential divider circuit so we know that that the potential divider circuit acts in a way so that it diverts the voltage according along means in the in between the uh, resistance or the components according to their resistance so if the resistance is more then it will get more potential difference here it happens the same they are asking that the lamp is getting more current more current means more voltage more voltage means more resistance so resistance of the lamp increases what is the explanation because we learned more current passes means what the temperature goes higher resistance goes higher as well so you write down as temperature increases resistance increases got it guys so b uh, first b the statement is resistance increases then expansion will be temperature increases as temperature increases resistance increases okay is it clear to you now yes miss fine now let's go to the question number 11 that's the uh, radioactivity question okay so i want you to go to this question i think the first one is an equation write down the nuclide equation for this liquid what was that radon 232 is emitting an alpha particle and it is becoming a polonium so i think yes. you can write down this equation Right then, and yes, uh, just tell me, Alia, are you done with the equation? Yes, I have already written. May I tell? Okay. Fine. Sure. So it's the symbol of radon R A, and then we have in the mass number like two two two, and in the proton number we have eighty six, and then we give the arrow, uh -huh. which gives alpha particle four mm -hmm. and above mm -hmm. and two plus mm -hmm. we have the uh, oh, new radio uh, radon uh, no new nucleus to be honest. I don't know. Okay. I'll just check what to name it in the periodic table, but then it's no, no, no. sub no, no. Uh, minus. Reason? It's already written in the question paper. P O polonium. polonium. Yes. P -O. So polonium, and I I got it by two two twenty two minus four. Okay. Uh, which is uh one hundred uh eighteen. Two eighteen. Yes. Two eighteen and eighteen. Yes. Okay. Now you tell me. Uh, what is the symbol of radon that you wrote there? It's R A. No. R A is radium. Radon is R N. R N O. Okay, I'll correct it. That's fine. So let's go for the next part of the question. Uh, carbon fourteen is radioactive. Radioactive with a half life of five thousand seven hundred years. An animal born is dug up in an archaeological excavation. The quantity of carbon fourteen in the bone is twenty five percent of what it was when the bone was buried. Okay. So we know that after the time it was buried from there, it will start decreasing. By uh, means that time it was hundred percent, then it will come to fifty percent, fifty percent to twenty five percent. So now they got it as twenty five percent. So calculate the time that has elapsed since it was buried. So you show it like this: hundred percent put an arrow on the top, one half life. Then fifty percent. Then put another arrow on the top, one half life, and then twenty five percent. So three half lives. Yes. Okay. Uh, I can see Sanjita is asking uh, to explain question number seven A and B. Okay. Actually, we do this right. I think you joined me late. Okay. Uh, Sanjita, I think you joined us late here in the morning when when I started my class. I explained it. Okay. Fine. So let me do it for you again. Okay, uh, Anika, just hold on for one minute. Okay, let me do one thing. Let me do one thing, Anika. Let us finish this question, then I'll go back and explain seven uh, A and B for Sanjita one more time. Okay. Now, uh, did you show that uh, calculation? Hundred percent to fifty percent, then to twenty-five percent. 
Miss, I did that. But then after that, um, am I supposed to like uh, divide uh, 500, uh, 5,700 years? Like no, no, for no, three no, half-lives? No, 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 no. We have two half-lives. So you write down total time equals, write down total time equals two half-lives yes. equals to two multiplied by 5,700. You can multiply. We have Why, Miss? Two half-lives is gone. Then it became 35%. Okay. That's it to multiply. You're not going to divide. You're finding out the time. When you're finding out the amount of nucleus left, then we divide. Okay. So for time, we have to multiply. Exactly. We have to multiply. Okay. So you will be getting the answer around uh, 11,400 years. Okay. okay. Now, let me just go back to 7A and B. Okay. Now, Sandida, as you asked me the question for A and B7, it is about the data. So you remember, Whenever a converging lens is there, we are going to, and we have a uh, we have an object which is a point object. That time, the way they gave us the first diagram, that is figure seven point one, you have to extend the two rays of light that is coming out from the point object to the middle point of the uh, lens, middle line of the lens, and then from there you are going to join them to the screen, the point where the uh, principal axis meets the screen. This is the first one. And why it is like this? Because we know that they say they got the image already on the screen. So we don't have to think twice, we just do that. Then in question number part B, okay, in part B of the question, what happened? They say they replaced that particular lens with another thin lens, but they did not change the position of the screen or the object. And they're asking us in this new situation, we have to draw the position of the image. But as we got a thinner lens, you remember a thin lens is always having a longer uh, wavelength. Thin lens will always have a longer wavelength. Okay. Aliyah, I'm not sure whether you found the question. It is 42 major 19. Okay, 42 major 19, question number 7. You said we stopped at question number 6. From 7 onwards, I started today. Okay. So now, as I was telling you, 7B part of the question. Whenever it is a thin lens, you have to always uh, find out or you'll get the uh, focal length of the lens longer than before. That is why you're going to join at the back of the screen, you highlight a point anywhere, it's your wish. At the back of the screen, highlight a point, which will be on the top of the principal axis, and then just join them. The first part will remain the same, the two images will come to the uh, center uh, line or the middle line of the lens, and from there it will just go at the back of the screen and join them. So this is the diagram and this is the explanation because a thinner lens is always having a longer wavelength. Okay, now let's go for the next part and we were done with question number 11. I think we are done with this 42 variant. Yes. Girls, what do you yes, say? Now which variant are we gonna do? Uh, that's what I'm asking. Shall we complete 42 today? What do you say girls? Okay, let's do What this. is it again, Miss? 43 major. 43 okay. major 2019. Okay, let's finish that first. Okay, all of you pick up uh, 43 major uh, 16, sorry, major 19 and 18. Because you need to have it, otherwise you Miss, won't could you anything. please give, give me a minute? Uh, it'll, it'll just take a minute to download, Miss. Okay, good. Okay, the rest of you, those are having Please go to 42, 43, major 19. Done, Miss. Okay. Now, I hope all of you, the rest of you, do have that uh, variant so that we can discuss about this particular question now. Okay. okay. The first part Miss, of the question. What, yes, yes. Miss, what variant is it? Um, We're doing 43, major 19, question number one. 43, major 19? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. okay. Now, all of you look at the first question. It is uh, about a motion graph question. Okay, so I want you to take the question so that we can go for this solve this part. Okay, so they say they gave us a graph, and if you just look at the graph, they're asking what is happening. Uh, we have to explain the motion between Q and R. If you just look at the data, Q and R. Acceleration. Mm, could you just check it very carefully because look, it's a distance time difference. Huh? 
So distance times okay. don't give us acceleration I, direct. I'm, I'm not really good at motion graphs, to be honest. I don't understand them too good. Okay. You remember? Do I try to? Listen. You remember distance time graph, we can actually get speed from there. Or velocity, you can say both the way. So if you look at distance time graph, you can see P to R, if you take a ruler or a scale, you see it's a straight line. So whenever it is a straight line, we say it's a nothing but constant speed or constant velocity. Okay, so this is constant velocity or constant speed. Okay. Now, come to the next part, R to S. Now, if you just look at it, R to S, this part of the graph is inclined to the time axis. So you remember any graph which is inclined to the time axis, especially the motion graph, it will be the quantity which is decelerating. So here, as I said, uh, it is a speed, you'll get it. So uh, speed is getting decreased. So what do we call it a name? Isn't it a deceleration? Yes, De yes. Decreasing speed is called deceleration. So you can write it, deceleration, negative acceleration, decreasing velocity, all with the answer. Deceleration, negative acceleration, or uh, decreasing velocity. All, all could be the correct answer for this particular part of the question. Okay, now look at this x to t. We know that. Can we call it stationary? Yes, it is a stationary state. So you can write at rest or stationary. Because it's a distance time graph, whenever we have a straight line, we can understand the object is not moving. Now, come to the next part of the question, part B. Calculate the speed between U and V. Okay, it's a straight line, and we can go for just gradient of the graph. So, the can use distance by is, time. Uh, no, 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 it's, a, uh, it's our uh, graph, motion graph, so you have to use that equation. Y2 minus Y1 divided by X2 minus X1. 1.6 meter per second. Yeah, correct. 1.6 meter per second, that's the right answer. But you have to show, because if you just look at it, U, sorry, U and V, so U goes to 300 in the x-axis and V is at 400. Now you have to calculate or check in the y-axis, V goes to 600 straight, you can see, and U goes to, uh, up to here, we got 1 and 2. So each square is 20. So it is 440. Yeah, fine. Now it is 440. So you, it is coming out 600 minus 440 divided by 400 minus 300. And finally, you'll get the result 1.6 meter per second. Done, guys? Yes, miss. Okay, part two of the question. Uh, they say after point B, the straight road continues down a steep hill. Okay, the cyclist travels down the stage here. He does not apply the brakes and all resistive forces can be ignored. So, on the figure, what's the motion for the cyclist after this? Now, girls, one thing you need to remember that if I draw a straight line, so what do you think? From V, if I draw a straight line till the end. Oh, no, it's not the straight line. Uh, is it a straight line? No, yeah, it will not be a straight it line. It is not. Yeah. It's curves. It will upwards. be a curve. Yes, it will be a curve upwards because towards here uh, uh, it is actually going to increase the velocity. That is why it has to be a curve inclined to the y axis. So you just extend it uh, to the x axis, uh, sorry, to the y axis inclined. Just extend the line with the curve towards the y axis. That is called the inclined to the y axis. It cannot be a straight line because the Velocity was not constant. It was increasing velocity. It was down the hill. That is why. Okay. Now, I yes, think we are done with this question. Let's go to question number two. Okay. Now, question number yes. two is about, okay, uh, it's a dog, dog wall is also there. It's a page where the ships are going to, uh, with the dog there. Okay. Uh, the ship is moving slowly sideways at 0 0.4 kilometers per second as it comes in the, uh, into the dock. Okay, sideways and it is moving. Okay, fine. The ship hits the wooden pillar which moves towards the dock line. Okay, 
equation. So what is the years are there? It moves to the top one. Calculate the kinetic energy of the shape before it hits the pillar. Okay, we know the formula. We use half square. mv square. Exactly. So ek equals to half mv square. We have the mass and the well, we have the velocity. Well, we have the velocity as well. That is side width. So, so 0 0.040 square. Remember, it is b square. Yes, sir. Yes. Let's get the answer. How much it comes from here? 960 joules. Nine sixty joules. Yeah, that one. Okay. Now I want you to check again that uh, the sheep is in contact with the pillars for zero point three zero second as it comes to rest. Calculate the average of force uh, exerted on the sheep on the side of the sheep. Okay. Uh, did you notice here they say that the pillar they have given us a time also. Right, at rest. Yes. Okay, so we can still go for F equals to mv minus mv divided by t. Yes, we can use that. Yes, fine. So continue with that equation. F equals to mv minus But Miss, do we have u here? u is zero because it comes to rest, isn't it? Okay. As it comes to rest, isn't it? So mv is zero. And the, and the mass so will be, you'll use the mass from the question. Done. Yeah. You can do that. And just check what's the answer from here. 160,000 uh, Newton. Mm. How much you got there? One. Welcome back, guys. Okay. Uh, I was in that question. Girls, could you hear me? Okay. Hello, girls, could you hear me? Yes, miss. Okay. So let's go for this question. I was doing, okay, that was, uh, you are finding out the force. So force equals to mv minus mv divided by t. And if you just check from there, uh, okay, actually I'm not sure how much you got there. I got it like this, 1.56 into 10 to the power 5 newton. Okay, uh, someone do the calculation that it will be easy for us to match with you. I got it 1.56. I got Hmm. Say, I say. got 160,000 newtons, so it would be like uh, 1.6 into 10 to the power of 5. Oh, exactly. Yes, that was our yeah. answer. Okay, so just hold on a second. Let me just take this calculation one more time. Uh -huh. okay. Did you round it up first? Because without rounding it up, I got 1.56 into 10 to the power uh, I got a direct answer. I got uh, directly uh, 160. Okay, no problem. I think, oh, no problem. We can continue with the same. No problem. Okay. So both the weight is different 1.56 and uh, we have or 1.6 into 10 to the power 5 weight. So the weight is different. Okay. Now, Miss, uh, what is B? Part B. That's what we are doing now. Sanjida. No, no, B, B, B. MV minus MU. Right? Yes. So V is the speed that you have right now, that is 0 0.040, and oh, mu will okay. become zero. Okay. U will become zero. That is all. Okay. Now, see part C of the question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Read it out. Miss, is it 1.6 multiplied by 10 to the power 5, right? Correct. Newton, definitely it is Newton. Okay. Now, see part C of the question. Assume that uh, the kinetic energy calculated in your Part A is used to do work moving uh, the pillar. Okay. Uh, <coughs> asking us to move the pillar. So, mm, that's it. Uh, calculate the distance moved by the pillar. Okay. First of all, you have to remember one thing. We always learn that uh, work done is actually nothing but the change of energy. Right. So, we by see time. W is uh, yes. uh, No, that is power you're talking about. Power equals to work done by time equals to energy change divided by time. But work done itself is nothing but the change of energy. So here, uh, this work done will be nothing but the kinetic energy that we have calculated initially. So let us write down 
W equals to F into B equals to EK. It's a derived equation. We don't have any straight equation like that. So we write on W or EK equals to W equals to F into D. From there, B equals to EK divided by X. Now, EK is 960 already we calculated, and F right now you have that is 1.6 into 10 to the power 5. And now check the answer. How much is it? Okay. Now, all of you, okay? So, the answer coming up. I got, I got 6 into 10 to the power of minus 3 uh, meters. Meters, yeah, meters. Okay, okay. So, I have to. Let's just have a look. Uh, that's what we're doing now. Uh, you can write, I got it actually 6.2. Okay, since it is 0 0.2, you can omit that, but it will be around 6.2 into 10 to the power minus 2, sorry, 3 meter. 10 to the power minus 2 meter. Got it? Miss, how did you do it? I got disconnected. Okay, I told you that time that EK equals to W equals to F into B. And you're supposed yes. to find out D. So D equals to, we can write, EK divided by F. And your EK was 960, and F was 1.6 into 10 to the power 5. So if you do the calculation, you'll be getting out around 6 points, or 6 into 10 to the power minus 3 meter. Okay? Now, they say, go for the D part of this question. Dog walls sometimes have the pillar replaced by the uh, rubber car tire. Okay, and now they are placing rubber car tire instead of the uh, instead of the pillar. Okay, fine. Explain how this reduces the possibility of damage when a boat docks. Okay, now as the boat docks, uh, before it was I think uh, made up of wood. In the first day, yeah, wooden pillars were right there. So now they are replacing all those wooden pillars with a rubber car tire. So what do you expect? What type of, uh, you know, you know, they will be receiving what type of force from this rubber tire or the one they were receiving before from the wooden pillar? Which one was more? So, uh, you can say that the uh, reactive force or the resistive force, which one would be the one? Will it be from the wooden pillar or from the rubber tire? Hmm? They will be actually receiving less force from the uh, rubber tire. Because you know rubber tires are flexible, so they cannot give us more amount of uh, resistive force. But since the uh, wooden pillars were obviously uh, hard, they will give us more resistance. So you can just write down uh, the boat when the boat docks. When the boat docks uh, due to the rubber tires, less force will work on the boat. Less force will work on the board. Less force will, be, will work on the board, and the boat will experience this force for a longer time. And the boat will experience this force for a longer time. So definitely, the impact of this force will be less because the time is more, uh, and the force is impulse of this force will be less. That is why it will not have that much of damage. Okay. I think now we can proceed. Is it done, girls? Okay. Let's go to the next part of the question. That is number three. We have here. Yes. This number three is about a pressure question. Uh, they gave us a small submarine submerged below the surface of the sea. Okay. So they gave us the density of the seawater and they're asking calculate the pressure due to the seawater on the top of the submarine when it is 3 into 10 to the power 3 meter below the surface. Okay. Pressure so equals H or G. Fine. So just place all the values and get answer. P equals H or G. H is the height towards the density. G is the acceleration due to gravity. And everybody knows we are going to use that as 10. How much you got the answer? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. I 
got it around 3.1 into 10 to the power 7 Pascals. Did it match with your answer, girls? What did you get, miss? 3.1 into 10 to the power 7 Pascals. 3.1, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. It may come 3.09. It can come Yes. We got it like that. I got 3.09, yes. Did it. Then it is also the correct answer. Don't, no worries. Okay. Okay. Now go to part B of the question. Okay. It seems like an eco question. Okay. Emerge that uh, some part over here in this number two question. So the submarine emits a pulse of sound to detect other objects in the sea. The speed of sound in water is 1580 per second. An echo is received with a time delay of 0 0.50 seconds after the original sound is emitted. Okay, we have to calculate the distance between the submarine and the other one. So, what's the formula do you remember? For echo? Uh, echo formula, what is that? D it was 2D by T, right? Then, we write the equation for D equals to D into T divided by 2. Make D as, uh, D as the subject. Thank you for the calculation. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thanks for coming up. Mm -hmm. I got around 375. Check whether you got the same answer. You can the same answer. Anita, I think you're following. So what, Miss, what did you get? 375 meters. Same. Okay. 375 meters. Fine. Now come to the next part of the question. Another pulse of sound is emitted to the air when the submarine is on the surface. Now the submarine came on the surface and an echo is received from the second object that is in the air. Okay. The echo is received again the same time, 0 0.50 second, after the pass of the sound is emitted. Compare the distance of the second object from the submarine with the distance calculated in B1. Take one of the box, give you a uh, the reason for the answer. <coughs> okay, so now <coughs> which one you think that will be the correct answer? I think it should be the first box. The distance would be smaller because uh, uh, the time taken is uh, less because um, the speed is uh, it's the speed More. of sound is greater in uh, liquids than it is in uh, when the submarine is float in air. I guess. Okay, fine. Your answer is correct. First, the uh, box has to be ticked, and the reason is just like that. Speed of sound in air is less than the liquid. Or speed of uh, speed of sound in liquid is more than in air. In okay. air, yes. In both the cases, purposely they gave us the same time to make us confused, but we will not get confused because we know the basic thing. Okay, do you remember what is the speed of uh, sound in air that we uh, mostly calculate with that? Three thirty meter per second. Yes, fine. That is at zero degree Celsius means three thirty is much much smaller than fifteen hundred meter per second. Yes, yes. So definitely that's the first box, and that is the way. Okay. Now, turn the page, if you're done with that. Uh, isn't it the same question? <clears throat> we'll be doing question number four now. It's done, the previous one. This isn't in the same question? Mm -hmm. 4A is the same. If this one you can do. Yes. 4A is very similar. Then, uh, I think in 42 variant, we had a similar question. Isn't exactly. It? Yes. I think in that question, we were finding out P. Here, we are finding out the uh, rise in temperature. That's the yes. difference one thing. So your equation will be E equals to PT uh -huh, because here they gave you four marks. So E equals to PT, one of the equation, another one E equals to MC delta theta. Then PT yes, equals miss. to MC delta theta. Then delta theta equals to PT by MC. For this rearrangement of the equation, we'll be scoring mark. That's why we need to write down all the basic equation and along with that, the uh, derived equation for delta theta. Making delta yes, theta miss. as the subject. Okay. So then it becomes delta theta is to pt by mc. So if you just place pt was uh, 370 and <clears throat> time was 4. So 4 into 60 because it was 4 minutes. We have to <coughs> take 
and then the uh, mass of this block was 5 kg and the specific heat capacity was 420. So if you do it 370 into 4 into 60 divided by 5 into 420. And then what's the answer coming up? <coughs> Take this, what's the answer? I got it around 42.23 or 3, I think. 42.3 degrees Celsius. You can just write down 42 degrees Celsius. Did you get that, Anika? Yes, miss. I got it. Okay. So now let's go to question number five. Uh, this is also another question that we had before, which I don't remember, but we had the same question previously. <coughs> it is just the one that we have. I remember that question didn't have the stopper. Here they put the stopper. And then they have the everything question. here. Yes, but they gave us the question uh, regarding the stopper at the end. So let's go for A part. Okay, that is the diagram of vacuum first. And they're asking, explain how to label the feature. Means we have a stopper there, and mm. we have a silver surface here. We have vacuum, we have glass. So all these yes. features, how actually it helps us to reduce the thermal energy transfer to the surroundings. They said they will okay. include the names of the uh, processes involved, okay. whether it is conduction, convection, radiation, we have to mention that one also. Okay, so let's go for the silver surface initially. Now, okay. do you remember? Uh, yeah, do you yes, remember? Silver surface for reducing thermal radiation. Mm -hmm. Silver surface for that. Okay. And then for the stopper, we can say to reduce conduction and convection. Mm -hmm. And then the vacuum, uh, have the, uh, the air has been removed for the same purpose, to reduce mm -hmm. conduction and convection. Mm -hmm. And then the glass, because it is an insulator and it won't lead heat to go in or out, right? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think it's good. So let's start with that one. Silver surfaces are good insulators, good reflectors. So it stops thermal radiation. Oh, I must, oh, I'm supposed to talk about this as well. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yes. Uh, then vacuum, uh, the part vacuum prevents thermal energy transfer by conduction and convection. You already mentioned that one, vacuum. Vacuum prevents thermal energy transfer by conduction and convection. Okay, then we have <coughs> glass. <laughs> that glass part also we have to mention. Uh, we know that glass is a poor uh, thermal conductor, so you can say uh, glass is a poor thermal conductor, so it reduces thermal energy loss by conduction. They said you have to mention the name of the process, so we have to do that. And finally, the one you mentioned earlier, that is copper. Copper is an insulator and it stops heat transfer by convection and radiation as you can mention. Both can be done. Convection and radiation due to the stopper because it's an insulating material. Okay. Now, part, shall I go to part B now? Yes, Miss Dunn, right here. That is a suitable material for the stopper. Then can we use rubber, Miss? Rubber, plastic, cork. All can be used because they are all good insulators. Insulators. Mm -hmm. okay, done. Now, uh, turn the page, go to question number six. And it is about uh, weight diffraction. If you just look at the diagram, you can understand it is a diffraction question. And check what is the question coming here. The first one is this state the name of the process that occurs as the weight of diffraction. Definitely. Okay, and the next part of the question, you have to be careful because nowadays they give very smart questions. Uh, you know the diagram, but you have to understand the main point here. They say a wave with a wavelength lambda by two. So you have to measure the lambda that you have in the first part in 6.1 diagram, and then you have to divide it by two, lambda by two this. Okay, and then they say, as it approaches the gap, and uh, we have to draw three more waveforms as the, yes, three days only, as the wave continues uh, beyond it. So it will have, when we draw, it will have shorter wavelength as well. 
the last diagram with you, I remember, right? Yes, yes. And and one more thing you can remember, they did not change the length of the uh, the gap size. So the gap size you're going to draw just the way they gave to you, only in the lambda you're going to reduce to lambda by two. So, Ms. Okay. Uh, in the, the, the diagram, I remember we have kept very less space, but here we have kind of big. So how will it affect the wa uh, waves, the, like the new waves? The fourth diagram that you, you have in your copy, see, in my diagram, I got lambda as uh, one, one centimeter. So definitely I have to draw 0 0.5 centimeter. Okay, but we have, to, okay, they have already given us the uh, gap size, so it is not changed. And the fourth diagram is that it is going to have a, a less angular diffraction means almost a straight line will come out from the uh, yes. gap, uh, gap side, the edge of the gap side, and then you're going yes. to draw after that. Huh? But it will be the fourth diagram, you remember. Because here, the gap size is more than the wavelength. Okay. So will it be uh, the, like, the diff uh, it will diffract at edges or like that? No, but you have to do it like this. Look, so you'll be drawing the uh, direction of the trouble, that is the incident we will call, it will go through, yes. and then from the edges, you're going to draw two lines which will be very close to the middle line because the angular diffraction will be very less. The fourth mm -hmm. diagram, which I have the note, just give the fourth diagram the same one. Okay. okay. Now, let's go to the next part of the question. I think today I can do till six. And inshallah, next week, uh, the rest of this question I'll be doing because uh, today is the third class I have been this week. Okay, now take the last part of the question here. This is table. 6.1 gives five different types of electromagnetic waves. Okay. They say that uh, electromagnetic waves, you have to uh, mention the order of the wavelength. So, uh, 1 to 5 is the order. So, if you remember the order of the uh, uh, position of these uh, wave uh, patterns of the uh, of this particular electromagnetic wave uh, family members, you remember that. Gamma is always at first one. Right? Gamma, then X wave. Isn't it, girls? Yes. So if and gamma then, is one, then X ray will be two. Then we and then have ultraviolet. Ultra, yes, ultra, and then we have light, visible light. Then light. we have microwave, micro, microwave, and then yes, microwave, microwave. radio wave. Microwave radio belongs to the same group actually. So yes, microwave yes. is number five. So then, then this is change the speed of radio waves in here. So definitely ten to ten to the power eight meter per second. Yes. Then a radio station transfers radio waves with a frequency of 96 megahertz. Mega means you have to multiply by 10 to the plus 6 to come to hertz, regular wave. Then V yes. equals to F lambda, lambda equals to V by F. So V, we have and F, we have done calculation. Yes. So 10 to 10 to the power 8 divided by 96 into 10 to the power 6. Okay, because megahertz we are converting, then it comes from here. 3.125 meter. Okay, did you get the same value? Yes, Miss, I got the same answer. Okay, fine. So, as I said, we are uh, running out of the time. So, inshallah, next week, if you want me to continue, I'll continue from question number seven one more time. And we, we have the October November session as well. After doing this yes. one, October November session we can do, and then we can go for paper six. Few questions are still there for us, so I want to yes. do that. Okay. As I have all the students, almost uh, nine students, some of them didn't join me back. But I just try to want to remind you about the tuition, tuition fees. Just uh, remind your parents about it. And today also you got the message from Ms. Anju. And if you have any query, you can ask your homeroom teacher. Or in this group, you can uh, message. And anyone responsible will give you the answer. Okay, girls? But make sure that you're informing your parents. Okay? Okay, miss. Yes, miss. So, inshallah, I want to uh, have a class with you in next week, and this will be the end of this week class. So, all of you stay safe and pray for all of us. Okay? Inshallah, miss. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Take care. You too, dear. Bye.